control of the steering wheel of my life and do what you want to do. I yield myself to you. For in you, there is life and joy and strength and peace. And we just want to start out today by thanking you for keeping us another week from dangers we could see, some we could not. You've been such a gracious God. You protected us from crazy drivers. You protected us from the arrow and bullets that fly by day and the pestilence that stalks the night. Thank you, Lord, that you are a prayer answering, merciful, protecting, and keeping God. When the enemy rises up like a flood, you represent a standard against him. And therefore, the devil was unable to overcome us because of what you have done in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the death. Thank you for the burial. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the ascension. We walk in victory. We walk in peace because of what Jesus has done. You're worthy of praise today. Somebody ought to praise God for what's been done. So have your way in our lives. Have your way in our homes. Have your way in our marriages. Have your way in our singleness. Have your way in our finances. Have your way in our economics. Have your way in our driving. Have your way in our eating. Have your way in our exercising. Have your way in our sleeping. Have your way in everything in our lives. Now, would you give us a fresh revelation of your word? We might be able to process it in our minds, ultimately live it out in our lives. And what is accomplished, whatever that is, we'll say yes to your will. In the marvelous, mighty, wonderful, unspeakable, ineffable, never-ending, never-tiring, indefatigable name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, Every knee shall bow one day and every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble and prostrate fall. At the name of Jesus, bondages are broken, doors are open. At the name of Jesus, victory is proclaimed and folks are saved. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Praise God. And amen. Be seated, so glad you're here today. Without the black church, there would be no African-American community. Now that the African-American community no longer values the black church, we are losing and we have lost our identity. In this series for Black History Month, I'd like to argue for the ongoing importance of the black church. And to do so, I've been considering the untold political history of African Americans, which is tied up with our religion and with the black church. God impressed this subject upon me when I was reading Setting the Record Straight, American History in Black and White by David Barton. It's a unique view of the religious and moral heritage of black Americans with an emphasis on the old untold yet significant stories from the rich political history of our people. And the thought that I'd like to work with is the church in the wilderness. And I'm about to get tied up right there because since I've taken that title, God's showing me all kinds of stuff about the church in the wilderness. And the thought is taken from the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Holy Ghost. And since Stephen is about to be stoned, but before his stoning, he gives his first and only his and final sermon. And in that sermon, he begins to recount God's work in the history of the nation of Israel. And he talks about Moses' struggle with the children of Israel, and he drops this phrase that I'd like to use in that particular passage, Acts, the seventh chapter, the 35th verse. This Moses, whom they disown, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one whom God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out performing war wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of, of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation 
in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Go ahead and be seated. When Moses was down in Egypt land, the Negro spiritual says way down in Egypt land. He attempted to lead his people out of bondage by his own power. And his people disowned him and laughed at him and asked him, who made you a ruler and a judge? I don't know if there are any leaders in the house today, but when you are leading God's people, sometimes they will disown you. Yet this Moses was the same one who that God had sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in a burning bush that was burning but not consumed. And this man, Moses, led the children of Israel by performing signs, is the word that is used often in Exodus, and also through plagues that in the land, at the opening of the Red Sea and the miracle of manna in water that followed them underground in protection from their enemy in shoes that didn't wear out and I could go on and on while they were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years every now and then I like to go back and get that scripture and said when you enter into vineyards that you didn't dig and in houses that you didn't build and all that stuff then remember the Lord lest you forget him because I think we done forgot you driving a car you didn't build and live in a house that you didn't build and, and food that you didn't grow. That kind of sounds like America, don't it? Remember the Lord, lest you forget where he brought you from. Brought me from a mighty long way. And so this same Moses said, God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. And he's talking about uh, the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness, referring to God, who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He received living oracles, tablets to pass on. The congregation or church in the wilderness was the Israelites. And it says God was in their midst. If the Israelites were led out of Egypt into the wilderness to prepare them for a new start as a nation that they would represent God among the nations of the world. It was in the wilderness that God wooed them unto himself. It was in the wilderness that they were prepared by going through difficulties and struggles. And now we are the church in the wilderness of the world and God is in our midst and sometime he's got to prepare us by going through some difficult stuff. Bump your neighbor say, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that we're going to get a new season, that there is uh, going to be an enlarged territory. But when you read the Bible and you look at it, in order to grow, you got to go through some struggles. And now the church is returning almost to the, where we were the first 300 years of the church existence when we were nothing but a little band of, of Christians and saints who were being persecuted by the world. Before we came into the, uh, that, that meeting up with and joining with the power of the state. And so we are now going back. We're losing our power of the state. And people are not coming to church like they used to. Even black people ain't coming to church like they used to because they have a love of power rather than the power of love. And so they don't understand that how we got to where we are and what's going on. And not only that, God couldn't prepare us the way he wanted to prepare us when we were up in the world. He got to bring us down or let us come on down so he can talk to us and get our ear when you're out there in the wilderness. Who am I preaching to today? In the wilderness. Now, there are some of us who don't do reality well. They, they will see no need for these sermons because they are either unaware of or unimpacted by the FBI's report of the increase in hate speech and hate crimes, particularly against Jews and African Americans. I'm not interested in facing those things simply to talk about them, but so that we can respond as the church of Jesus Christ. Have we not figured it out yet? I think there's some smart people in this church. I don't know. But politics ain't getting it done, and, and, and neighborhood stuff ain't getting it done. We're going to need Jesus if we're going to get some of this stuff done that needs to get done. How did we get to where we are? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. But I want to give that disclaimer to whites are among, who are among us because you are incredible and there is no reason for you to feel guilty because you are a part of a rare group of people uh, who are interacting with us for the good of the kingdom. Several sources 
um, uh, have confirmed that 75% of whites have little to no contact with African-American people at all. Those of you who are here are the best of the remaining 25% to come in and be with us. And we're, we're glad to have you. Now, we want you to just be aware that we're a little crazy. We've been through slavery. We've been through some stuff. And that'll make you a little bit crazy. You ever feel a little crazy some days? Let me see where y'all at. Me wave your hand at me, the crazy folks. Okay, and ain't too many of y'all. Y'all, y'all going like, what's this? Is that you half crazy? I don't know. What's going on? So there's something that sh that ought to shock you, uh, and that is that most of the 400 years of our history in America is unknown. We know the political history, perhaps, of the African Americans for about the past 50 years, and a lot of that is not really clear. And not knowing or remembering the first 350 years of our ability blocks our ability to recognize what a remarkable people we are and what has been the main source of our accomplishment, which is Jesus the Christ. Here's what's important. In each of those accounts and hundreds of others, the strong Christian faith of black Americans is apparent. The faith is still active today as it ever was in a minority, in a remnant. And several recent polls show that Christian beliefs are higher among African American people than any other ethnic group in the country. I, I just want to uh, uh, report for some folks that some of us are still holding on to Jesus. We ain't going nowhere. Ain't nothing changed. I'm still depending upon him, I, 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 even though I, I, it's been some difficulties, even though it's been tough, even though we've been through some stuff, I'm still holding on to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. A lot of stuff is changing around me, but God's hand is stable. And that's the reason I'm able to stand up here before you today because I recognize where I come from and what God has done for me. And had it not been for God on my side, I have no idea where I'd be right now. But it's grace and mercy. I just want to thank you for what he's done for me. So let's move on for the facets of unknown and seldom considered African-American political history. Uh, we want to update you, and I don't know about you, but I'm not the brightest bulb in, in, in the pack, but I was um, the valedictorian at South High School in 1970, and I did try to pay attention and listen in school, and I don't remember none of this history. Now, and it wasn't because of uh, what your problem was. I just don't remember it. Now, for some of you who are still smoking marijuana, um, I need you to stop um, during the series so that you can catch up to what's going on because I, I don't want it to take some of those brain cells away that you need. We laughing because we got them issues. Uh, opioids is not the problem of the black community. It's marijuana, and as quiet as it kept, we don't talk about it. It's alcohol that's eating us up. Alcohol is tearing our community up. We're, we're not having an opioid problem. We got another kind of problem. How come I can't get no amens in here? Uh, I'm telling the truth too quick. That's what the problem is. Well, let's go on. Okay, so put that cigarette down, that, you know, that funny one, that rogue one, because I want you to hear this. The next year, 1857, a democratically controlled Supreme Court delivered the Dred Scott decision, declaring that blacks were not persons or citizens, but instead were property and therefore had no rights. In fact, quoting from the infamous decision, Democrats on the court announced that, and I quote, blacks have no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro justly and lawfully might be reduced to slavery for his own benefit, end of quote. I, I don't remember learning any much, much about that in school. I didn't get the quote, but I'm trying to help you understand what's going on so that history will not, we won't be repeating history, so that you are not bound by the things that you do not know. Democrats have always held that life is disposable, and African Americans have suffered from this belief more than anyone else. Consider that although 12% of the current population is African American in America, almost 35% of all abortions are performed on African American. In fact, over the last decade, for every 100 African American live births, there have been 53 abortions of African American babies. Democrats have encouraged this. 
And although black Americans are solidly pro-life, pro with almost two-thirds oppo opposing abortion on demand, a number of recent votes in the Congress reveal that Democrats hold exactly the opposite view, with some 80% of the congressional Democrats being almost rabidly pro-abortion and consistently voting against protections for the innocent, unborn human life. We are a remarkable people. And our lives are much too important to be destroyed in this manner. I don't think we understand that as you look across time and you begin to see the mechanisms that have been used to try to destroy us, we're not going to contribute to our own destruction. My mother used to say to me, don't give the devil a stick to hit you over the head with. Let him find his own stick. But we, because of ignorance, are participating in things that may actually be destroying our own people. In 1860, Republican Abraham Lincoln won the presidency on a platform that announced its continued intent to end slavery and to secure equal civil rights for black Americans. Republicans also won a majority in the U.S. House and Senate in that election, thus giving Republicans control of the lawmaking progress for the first time. Now remember, this is the political history that is untold and is not known. I don't remember any of that in school, and I was there. Remember, that was back in my perfect attendance days. I thought that if you, said you had perfect attendance, that that was the thing to do. And so I did that for the first 15 years that church never missed a Sunday morning for 15 years because I thought God was giving perfect attendance certificates in heaven and so when somebody told me that he wasn't I was messed up you mean I don't get no perfect no certificate for this but I've been going on vacations ever since <laughs> what was the Democrats response to what the so to what the Republicans were doing. Some Democrats left Congress and took their states with them, forming a nation that they described itself as the slave-holding Confederate States of America. While the Northern Democrats did not support the secession, they still supported slavery, and they opposed civil rights for blacks and Americans. In short, the main difference between Southern and Northern Democrats at the time was their secession, not slavery. The citizens of this new slave-holding nation became known as the rebels since they were in rebellion against the United States. And the Confederate flag, no matter what people are trying to say today, is a holdover from slavery. It takes amazing resiliency to survive and even to thrive in a South and in a country that still displays images that represent past slavery. You don't have to go to the South to see a Confederate flag. You ain't got to go far. And then when you look at it, it reminds you of the slavery and where you came from. But God has allowed you to thrive in the midst of this kind of stuff that's going on. You are an amazing people because you believe in Jesus Christ. It wasn't politics that got us through. It wasn't congressional stuff that got us through. It was prayer that got us through. It was praying because we didn't have the seats. We didn't have the power, but we prayed until God sent white folks to help us. We prayed. We pushed until something happened. And when are we going to come back and figure out that unless we get back to prayer, unless we begin to trust Jesus, Nothing's going to happen. With the election of 1860, the Republicans were firmly in control of the federal government. So they quickly began implementing significant changes. In 1862, they abolished slavery in Washington, D.C. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, freeing all slaves in the southern states that were in rebellion. The Emancipation Proclamation was eagerly anticipated by many black Americans who gathered around clocks and watches, eagerly awaiting the arrival of midnight on December 31st, 1862, because the proclamation was to take effect on the first moment of January the 1st, 1863, 
The famous Frederick Douglass attended one such rally, and when midnight arrived, a celebration erupted, and Douglass exclaimed, it was one of the most affecting and thrilling occasions I ever witnessed, and a worthy celebration of the first step on the part of a nation in its departure from thraldom, and the word means bondage of the ages. That's the history, in case you don't know, behind watch night services in our community. The reason we have watch night services was not to come and just watch a new year in, was not to come and watch the devil, was not to come and, and, and drink some, some booze at that time, not to come and shoot guns up in the air. We were waiting for emancipa our emancipation to take place, and we gathered at churches and places to pray that, that, that they would sign the Emancipation Proclamation so we could be set free. It was a religious thing. It was not simply an intellectual thing. So here we are now. We don't even come to watch night service because we don't know that watch night service is the celebration of our emancipation. We come and we have come because we don't recognize we ought to be thanking God for what he's done for us and where he has brought us from. We are now thriving because of what God has done. And if you don't feel like you're thriving, maybe I need to take you back about 100 years and then drop you off and see how you do back there. I know some of y'all are like, well, it ain't all that good today. Oh, it's a whole lot better than it was. It, it, we got our problems, we got our issues, and we shall have discrimination and racism on until probably Jesus come, because that's just the nature of the bee. But, you, but you're thriving in the midst of what, uh, of what was done to try to destroy you. You, you got, you, if, they, if they don't want to serve you at McDonald's, you can go on over to Burger King. And if they don't want to serve you at Burger King, you can go around the corner to Wendy's. Somebody wants your black money. They don't care what your color is, just bring them greenbacks on up in here and we can help you. That's, been, that's progress. Even at the meantime, while we're going backwards in hate crime and in hate speech. I want to apologize to you that there's so much history here that I have to skip a lot of it. Someone has just have to jump forward. Uh, one of our members who's a, his, his, uh, degree is in history, has been coming up helping me out and saying, oh, yes and that, and he's bringing up other stuff. I just can't cover all of it. It's too much. I only got four Sundays to do it, and if I don't get it done in four Sundays, some of y'all will be mad, so I got to get done. This led to the Civil War. I'm not going to cover that history, but merely state that many African Americans fought in the Civil War. This is something that doesn't seem to be well known among uh, people, even in it wasn't taught in school. We didn't get it anywhere. But we are Americans through and through. We are African in our ethnic descent, but American in our heritage. Every now and then I have to try to help people because they don't understand. Some of us are still taught, uh, caught back in the black power day. And I, and I ain't got no problem with you. Wear your dashiki. Do your thing. Just understand that you ain't African. You're American. You are African descent. And we honor that descent, but you are American in your heritage, in your cultural heritage. And if I would take you right now and drop you off in Africa, you would be in a world of hurt. And you would figure out, that's not my home. That's not my, I, I don't understand what they're doing over there. I don't, because you're not, that's your, that's your ethnic descent, but it is not your heritage. You are an American. You act like an American, you cry like an American, you bougie like an American. What's wrong? What's wrong with y'all? What's y'all problem? Be looking all, I'm just trying to help you out, walking around wearing all kinds of stuff, looking good, wearing nice purses and shoes, and bougie, bougie. Wearing and, and carrying purses I don't even know the name of. Let me take you on down here to, to uh, what's that, what's that, uh, maybe J.C. Penney? No? Where, where, where I could go get a good, a good cheap purse? Where could I go? Walmart? Okay, mess the sermon up. Let's go, let's go. 
Uh, let's go. I mean, we are so blessed, we don't even know we're blessed. What we drive, what we eat, what we wear, we're blessed. I said we're blessed. And I thank God for every blessing that he's brought into my life. The 13th Amendment to end slavery was passed by a Republican House in which virtually every Democrat voted against it. Here are some facts that will astound you. At least they did me. Therefore, for a few years, Republicans became the political majority in most of the southern states. And those Republican legislatures moved quickly to protect voting rights for African Americans, to prohibit segregation, to establish public education, to open public transportation, state police, schools, and other institutions to black Americans. Not only were the Southern legislatures at that time Republican, but at least for a few years, nearly every Southern legislator, legislature included many black legislators. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know this history. That's why I'm so fascinated. I, I, I thought there were never any African American politicians. Le can I help you with that? In fact, the first 42 blacks elected to the state legislature in Texas were all Republicans. In Louisiana, the first 95 black representatives and the first through 32 black senators were Republicans. In Alabama, the first 103 blacks elected to the state legislature were Republicans. In Mississippi, the first 112. In South Carolina, the first 190. In Virginia, the first 46. In Florida, the first 30, as well as in North Carolina. In Georgia, 41 blacks were elected to the state legislature all as Republican. I'm not even aware that that many African Americans held, held public office any time. Much less that they did it in the South much less that they were Republicans. We are a remarkable people. And the basis of that progress was not just political, but religious. I'm, I'm arguing, I'm pleading, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I feel like King James Version, I'm beseeching black people to figure out where they came from and go back to prayer. Prayer would solve your situation. Prayer would rectify and straighten out your emotional issues. Prayer could set you on a road that would be recovery and that would take you where God wanted you to do. Prayer could not only change some things, but it just might change you. Men People ought to always pray and not lose faith. Let's keep on praying because some stuff is going to happen. We're remarkable. We don't recognize that we prayed our way into freedom. We don't recognize that, that with Martin Luther King, they always get over there, they want to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. He wasn't no politician. He was a Baptist preacher preaching the love of Jesus Christ. That got him into politics. That got him into face in the, in, the, in the White House. That got him in the places. But he was constantly talking about love and prayer. And when you, if you do, whether you know it or not, before they went out to do their politicking, they was praying. They were singing Negro spiritual. They were going through and getting in touch with God before they went out on the street because they know they weren't going to be able to take what was poured out unless God was on their side. Now you come on and talk to me here this morning and quit looking at me like you half crazy. You know if somebody slap you, it's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost to keep you from not cutting them a new smile because I know your switchblade is down in your purse. I, I know where you come from. Oh, y'all going to try to act like you've been saved all your life. I know where you come from. Some of y'all come from rough places and, and, and act, sit up in here so diddy like 
like I'm just a saint of God. Don't you push the saints up in here. You'll find out that the part of them that don't come to church will come out. Part you haven't seen before. All them tongues will be turned over. We are remarkable people. I mean, we can go through all that we went through and sit up here and act like, you know, I've always been this way. Oh, no, I, I, I remember. I'm not having that issue. I remember when I had no clothes and barely a ride and all. I remember that stuff. Because if you remember where he brought you from, it can generate some joy down in your soul. And it'll bring up some thanksgiving. And you'll begin to want to just thank God for what he's done for you. Because he brought me from such a mighty long way. When I look back over my life and think about where he brought me from, my soul it starts to get filled with joy. And I feel like shouting and praising because I remember. I don't want y'all to shout too much. This is a serious message. We're talking about the political history. And so, to put it in African-American vernacular, so what had happened? What had happened? I just read off you a list, an impressive list of black folks in politics, a long list of numbers. Well, what had happened? I'm going to tell Brother Gordon since y'all don't want to know. <laughs> what happened was violent attacks were launched by Democrats against Republicans. Now, let me just say this right now because I'm going to get into trouble because I'm telling the history and you don't know the history. So after a while, you're going to be saying like, where he get that stuff from? You could go look it up yourself. You ain't got to take my word for it. And I heard that uh, um, Spike Lee was on talking about it. You ain't got to take his word for it. Because I heard he was wrong. That he was telling folks just what I told you, the opposite of what I told you last week. That the three-fifths law is about, uh, it's about race. It's not about racism. It wasn't about discrimination. It was about representation. So even people who are on the TV who profess to be experts don't know the history. And so what you need to do is go and read it yourself. So you can know what's going on. I'm not getting no amens right there. Wednesday night, I'll be busting them out. We've been working on a book for 20 weeks. I have, how many of y'all reading the book? 20 weeks, you ain't started reading the book yet? Don't you want to know from where you come from, for what God has done for you? Don't you want to know for yourself? So your identity is built up and resting on him? And not on what somebody told you. What something else, or else also happened in 1861. That's having a tremendous impact today. It, 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 all of it is, but this in particular. While there's a great debate about whether the Democrats started this group, its members were Democrats who declared purpose was to break down the Republican government and to pave the way for the Democrats to regain control in the elections. Does anybody know the name of that group? The Ku Klux Klan. Now you can look that up and you can find what Ku Klux means and where it came from. But you need to be aware of the fact that it was against the Republicans and the Democrats were by and large responsible, even though we don't know whether they started it or not. It's sad. And it takes great resiliency to live in a country where hate speech and hate crimes are on the rise. After 400 years, that you still got to face some of the stuff that we are still facing, it's, dis it's discouraging. And hate groups may not be on the rise, let me just be very accurate, but simply becoming bolder because our president has given them the right to say anything they want to say. It may not be any more hate group, but because he, and he's not the cause, he didn't cause this, he just sets a climate where people feel, I can say whatever I want to say, and can't nobody do nothing about it. He can lie and do whatever he wants to do, and not even the Republican minority Christians who are his, a part of his base will call him on the stuff that he does and what he says. 
And so we feel the same way. We can just say what we want to say, make the truth out of a lie and a lie out of a truth, and can't figure out why America can't get ahead doing what it needs to do. But it was never that way in our neighborhood. I said it was never that way in our neighborhood. And that's because we were, by and large, a religious people, the people that went to church, the people that believed in Jesus. I mean, even if you drunk, you believed in Jesus. You wouldn't do nothing to folks uh, or, or hurt nobody or do anything like that because this was your community. And now we got people stealing copper out of our furnaces. They'd have done it two times. Come in, stripped all the copper out at the church. Don't you be looking at nobody around you because everybody you're looking at ain't saved. Look, don't look at nobody. Look up here. It's tough. And it tells you what a great people we are, that we could still be here doing as well as we're doing after all of the stuff that we've had to face. And I said the reason is Jesus. That's the reason. Wasn't because we were good, wasn't because of politics, wasn't because of what we brought with us from Africa, wasn't because of what we acculturated when we got here in America. It was because of Jesus. The first African-American elect elected to the U.S. House was Joseph Hain Rainey of South Carolina. If I put that on a test, would you have got it right? We, we should know that at least. Rainey was the first of 23 black Americans elected to the U.S. Congress, all Republicans. Let me stop for a minute because I'm going to get in trouble because some people are going to say, are you saying that we should be Republican and Democrat? No. I'm just telling you the history. Up until about 80 years ago, and I'm going to tell you about how that turns out next week, and I'll start some of it this week, no black person would ever be a Democrat. And you're hearing the history why we wouldn't. But it doesn't matter what party you are. We don't vote party. We vote principle. <laughs> Test one, two. Is, is mic on? We don't vote party. We vote principle. The Republican Party's got its issues. The Democratic Party got its issues. The Tea Party got its issues. We vote principle. Remarkably, of these early black congressmen, 13 had been slaves, considering the amazing transformation that this represents. I mean, try to take this in. This is remarkable. In five years, black Americans had gone from being slaves to being members of Congress. In five years. And all of them were home or self-educated. Where would they get any education? There were no schools open to them. Additionally, three of the five were ministers. Seven were attorneys. Five were school teachers. Four were university presidents. Thirteen were state legislators. A distinguished group with momentous achievements. And Democrats did not elect their first American to the U.S. House until 1935. And that one lone black member was from Illinois, another, a northern state in which blacks had always been free. We are a remarkable people who have had remarkable political impact in spite of the barriers that have been placed in our way. And I want to just take a moment here and give a commercial if I could. I just want to take a moment and just give a shout out to something that I think is so important that I think we take for granted. I want to restate the importance of informal home and self-education. I have used that plus some schooling to be a guest lecturer in the Department of Theology at the Ashland Theological Seminary for two semesters now. I, they've asked me to come in and, and do a guest lecture to the Doctorate of Ministry student on culture in the African American church and in the world. You need to figure out how that took place. They, they, they don't know how, they, how I got up in there. I got up in there because I kept on reading until they say, this boy must know something. 
let them on up in there. And so as I'm, I'm teaching my class, there are various students that are in the class who are working on their doctorate. And they say, well, Dr. Johnson, I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor? No, I, I don't have that degree. I'm, I'm just, uh, well, then, then they get confused. Then, well, what you doing in here? Because when you got Jesus, he'll open a door for you. He'll make a way out of no way. And folks will be trying to figure out what happened. How did you get up in here? Who opened the door and let you up in here? Because God is a God who can open doors. And so I, I happen to be the one who I don't have a doctorate, but I mentor doctors. And I've helped any number of folks write their doctoral dissertation, although I've never written one myself. I know how to write them. And I've helped people to write them. You say, what would you say? That? That's what favor does. That's what favor. He'll open up the windows of heaven. And pour you out a blessing. You won't have room to even receive. And so, while y'all celebrating me, I, I'm going to get on you. But while you celebrating me, how come you ain't reading? Now stop by all that amen and that stuff. Here you are, don't recognize that everything that, that the dominant society has tried to do is to keep you out of education because they recognize that you'd be dangerous the more that you learn. In the Bible, it's not about learning information, it's about transformation. You ain't ignorant, you're bound. You're bound in sin and you're caught in the power of death. The, the, the transformation comes from the revelation of Jesus. When Jesus reveals himself, he'll get you out of bondage and he'll deliver you from death unto life. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's part of our problem, that we are, don't understand that we ought to read, we ought to do all those things. We're not reading to get smart. We're reading to get to know Jesus. And Jesus will give you something that smartness will never give you. He'll give you wisdom. And wisdom, he said, I'll give it to you beyond your brothers, beyond those all around you. They'll wonder how you know the stuff you know. Don't you know what they asked about Jesus when he was here? They said, how did he know this stuff? And he ain't never studied letters. In other words, how could he know this when he didn't study with the rabbis? How could he know this when he's not a part of the temple structure? How could he know this and not be an official part of the Pharisees? How could he know it? Because God had put a download on him, had dropped it from heaven into his spirit through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's a revelatory knowledge. It's not an information, but a transformation. Hallelujah. And so let me make sure I go the other way so that I give good balance in here. Because there are going to be some people that are going to say, well, I, they're going to get real guilty. You know, I don't, Bishop, I don't read 50, 100 books like you. You ain't got to. How about if you just read one? Forget about it, whether you read 50 or 100. Just read one. How about reading the Bible every now and then? How about getting one book and finishing it this year? And one. People, I don't, I don't read like you. Uh, reading is not, is not going to send you to heaven. I, reading is the antenna, the spiritual antenna that God uses in my life. In your life, it might be music. In your life, it might be nature. In your life, I'm not sure how he speaks to you. But you got to read one book. It's called the Bible. You got to read that sometimes. You got to get into it. But you're not reading it because you're ignorant. That's our problem. We, we sitting up arguing with educated people trying to make a make you do, we're going to enlighten you, make sure you ain't ignorant. Your problem ain't ignorance, your problem is bondage. You're bound in sin. Your problem ain't, ain't that, your problem is death. Death has passed under all of us and we need life. And life can only come in Jesus Christ. He gives you the gift of life. You ain't smart enough and you can't work hard enough to work your sin out. You need the gift of Jesus Christ. Woo! I'm preaching better than y'all shouting today. 
Ah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, the 1875 Civil Rights Bill was the last of almost two dozen civil rights bill passed under Republicans. And in fact, following the passage of the 1875 bill, it would take another 89 years before the next civil rights law would be passed. I'm going to slow down here because I'm not sure y'all getting this. Another 89 years. What, what had happened? Why did the outstanding progress come to an abrupt halt after 1875? I can't go into all of it, but could I just drop a few nuggets on you? Touch your neighbor say, say yes, he won't sit down if you don't. If you don't hurry up and, and help him. In 1876, this is the political history. Democrats gained control of the U.S. House for the first time since 1865. Therefore, with a divided Congress, Democrats successfully blocked any further progress in the civil rights era. Facing each strident and irrational Democratic obstructionist, the enthusiasm for fighting in that arena soon waned and the civil rights momentum was lost and nothing else was passed for 89 years. Not to mention that all of those folks that were elected lost their offices and none were reelected for almost to 1935. And then one here, one there. However, not only did Democrats gain the U.S. House in 1876, but they were able to bring Reconstruction to a close by having all federal troops withdrawn from the South and thus removing the final protective barrier between black Americans and those Democrats who aggressively sought to violate their newfound freedoms. Next week, I'm going to tell you how the Democratic Party became the party of African Americans. Next week, I'm going to tell you the nine out of the 12 um, uh, tactics that Democrats used to keep, you, keep us from voting for years. What? I'm sorry, scared them to death. I'm getting ready to holler. I should have said that first, huh? What? An amazing people we are. Think about the fact that after all that has been done, we are still here. After all's been said and done, we are still here, still standing, still alive, still trusting God, still with faith in Jesus. I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to turn around. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. I feel like preaching just a little bit to myself. Because had it not been for God on my side, I don't know where I would be right now, but by his mercy, by his grace, I stand before you today, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, name written in the Lamb's book of life, victory is in my, in my grasp, and I'm walking with Jesus every day the best I can. Sometimes I fall on board, but he won't let me fall overboard because with Jesus I got victory that goes beyond anything that the world can do to me for he whom the sun sets free is free indeed I need some free people to thank God for bringing you where he brought you to in your life I need some free people that say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God 
unto salvation. I thank God that he saved me one day. I thank God that he made a way out of no way. I thank God that he opened up some doors for me. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me a mighty long way. I'm about done. I'm about done. I'm just thinking back. That's all. I'm just thinking how doors he opened that should not have been opened. Bondages that he broke off of me when the devil was trying to hold me. Victory that he gave me when the devil wanted to destroy me. Life that he deposited in my account when I was broke and in debt. This is a good God and he's worthy of praise. Ain't nobody going to stop me from praising the God who brought me from a money long way. When I look back over my life and think about where he brought me from, makes me want to shout, makes me want to holler, makes me want to run, makes me want to speak in tongue because he brought me I don't know where y'all at, but he brought me from a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. We are an amazing people, not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. He came down and he went into death so he could rescue me out of the darkness and bring me into the marvelous light. Look where he brought me from. He had to taste death for me so he could free me. Irenaeus said, I'm studying him right now in depth. Irenaeus said, Jesus didn't come to give his life as a sacrifice. He came and he entered into death so he could rescue us. He walked into death and grabbed us and drug us out. And gave us victory. So that we could walk in the newness of life. I come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. The devil comes but to kill and to steal and destroy. He wants to bind you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. But Jesus came that you might have life. You bow your heads for a moment. If you don't know him, all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin you've, that I've sinned against you. Come in my life. Save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Salvation is a gift. Freedom is a gift. Life is a gift. All you need to do is receive the gift. Irenaeus said that we have now come to make Christianity an achievement and a knowledge instead of freedom and life. God wants to give you a gift. I was on TCT this week. They asked me to come on. They were talking about a scripture that says we ought to put on 
We ought to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness. Now they talked about it from the old American perspective. We got to work, and you know, sometimes it's hard, and I'm working. He didn't say work and do nothing. He said put it on. Where did the clothes come from? God provided them. How do I put them on? Just put them on and wear them. When you got up this morning and you put your blouse and your shirt on and whatever you put on and you came to church, was you working all the way here? No, you weren't working at all. You done forgot all about it. And you came and you walked in the gifts that God has given to you. It's a gift. If you prayed that prayer, they would like to pray with you so that you might be able to receive the gift. If you need a church home, I want to give you that opportunity. But thirdly, somebody in here ought to be saying thank you. Without you, I don't know where I would be.